Hey guys, so uh, welcome to Economics 1 BO3 and Economics 1 BB3, the micro and macro introductory economics. Um, my name is Radek, I'm your TA, and I will be uh, going through the chapters in your book. Now, if you're in macroeconomics, the first few chapters do pertain. Um, the chapters are the same in the micro and macroeconomics books, so you can follow along. Um, and if you're in microeconomics, I'll be going through all the chapters. So we'll start off with what is economics? Um, economics is a study of scarcity, how society allocates its scarce resources. Uh, resources can vary greatly, anything from land, labor, capital, money, time, and your leisure time. Now, therefore, economics is the study of how a study of people and uh, and how they allocate their resources and this is why McMaster has economics as a social science rather than part of commerce um, now economics in economics we have ten principles and uh, in this video I will explain them um, and refer to my other video for the quite comical uh, translation of these uh, ten principles so the first principle is people face trade-offs um, there's no such thing as a free lunch an example is going to school or going to work. So you finish high school and you can either continue your education at Mac or Mohawk or where have you, or you can go to work. Now, if you guys have chosen, obviously you have, to come to school, you are foregoing um, the minimum wage job that you would have had somewhere else. So let's say that you make 30000 a year. This year, to go to Mac, you have given up $30,000. That is your economic cost, well, part of your economic cost. Um, other examples are if you buy a beer, you have to give up $5. If you buy a coffee, you have to give up $2. Um, to go drinking, you have to give up a night of studying. To go out with a cute blonde, you have to get, forego the cute brunette. Um, so that brings us to principle two. The cost of something is what you give up, right? As I was saying, if you want to go out partying, you have to give give up a night of studying. If you want to go out um, to Wonderland, you have to forego going fishing with your folks. So there are trade-offs in all your decisions. Right now, I've traded off going to going out with my buddies to do this video. Um, anyways, so principle three: uh, rational people think at the margin. Now, I find this to be untrue. Rational actors think at the margin, such as firms. Uh, firms will think about hiring people, like uh, one person at a time, um, renting equipment one piece at a time. As soon as hiring that one extra person does not produce a profit, uh, they will not hire them. Now, people in your everyday lives, in our everyday lives, people don't think at the margin. We don't go to Tim Hortons and say, I want one glazed donut, I want one glazed donut, I want one glazed donut. No, we say we want 20 glazed donuts. So principle four, people respond to incentive. An incentive is a motive. A motive is something that influences to action or something that deters us from action. Uh, the code of academic integrity is something that is an incentive for us not to cheat on quizzes, exams, or tests, right? Because if you get caught cheating, you'll have to suffer the consequences. Student scholarships are incentive to study hard. Um, being paid to work is an incentive to give up your leisure time. So people respond to incentives. Now, principle five, trade can make everyone better off. Uh, trade allows countries to specialize and capitalize upon econ economies of scale. Um, now, this doesn't make sense to you right now, but remember uh, this principle in general, and in four months it will become really clear. Now, principle six, uh, markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Now, two key words, good and uh, usually. So if you've read the chapter, um, you've come upon this guy, Adam Smith. Now, Adam Smith says that the invisible hand of the economy brings all markets into equilibrium as long as there are no market failures, and we'll explain market failures later. Um, now markets can have monopolies, and monopolies are an example of when markets are not a good way of organizing economic activity, and as well in the next four months we'll see why. Principle seven, governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Now again, key words, can and sometimes. Governments regulate against cartels and monopolies, um, and this helps uh, create a fair allocation of resources in the market. Now, suppose, for example, you only have one supplier of a good, then there is no competition, and that person can charge any price that they want. Now, frankly, we don't have a lot of monopolies in everyday life, but the problem is there can be artificial monopolies, cartels. Um, so this is when, let's say you have a duopoly, you have two suppliers of a good, like oil, and these people collude, right? They get together and they price fix. 
Now this is illegal. Cartels collusion is illegal. And this is where the government will make the market outcome better. They have laws against collusion, therefore encouraging fair trades and fair market prices. So we'll learn more about that later. Now principle eight, a country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. Now just as a family, the more skilled the members are of a family, the more money they can make. The more specialized their skills, the more money they can make. Same goes for a country. The more productive a country is, the higher their GDP, gross domestic product, and um, the higher the standard of living is. Zoom in through principle nine, prices rise when the government prints too much money. Well, duh. Now imagine today you have a hundred dollars and it can buy you a hundred candy bars. Um, overnight, the government prints twice as much money as there is today. So tomorrow your money's only worth half as much. Now, all of a sudden the price of the candy bar jumps up to two dollars and your hundred dollars can only buy 50 candy bars overnight. And the only reason is because the value of the money went down as the government printed more of it. There's more money in supply, therefore there is less of a demand for it, you can say, and you need twice as much money as you did the day before. And this is based on the assumption that the government printed twice as much money as there was um, today. Tomorrow they had twice as much money. But we'll learn about that more later as well. Now, principle 10, society faces short-run trade-offs between inflation and unemployment. And basically, the book has a good, exa um, good explanation of it. So, uh, increasing the amount of money in the economy stimulates the overall level of spending and thus the demand for goods and services. Now, this is in the short run. Now, in the long run, uh, higher demand may over time cause firms to raise their prices. But in the meantime, it also encourages them to increase the quantity of goods and services they produce and to hire more workers to produce the goods and services. More hiring means lower unemployment. So in the short run, the government stimulates the economy by printing more money. But in the long run, um, it will even out. We'll see that whole half 50, 50 candy bar effect as opposed to 100 candy bar effect. But right overnight, prices don't adjust. Prices are what we say is sticky. It's called menu costs. And that's something we'll touch upon as well. So we're gonna go through a few key terms that really popped out at me um, in this first chapter. Now, there are a lot of key terms that you really should know, but I'm gonna go through a few of them, key ones. First one is scarcity. A resource is scarce when there is only a finite amount of it. Another way of saying this is when the supply is limited. When we think about things in society every day, money is scarce. Right? As students, we really know that. We only have a finite amount of money that we can spend uh, every week. When we think about fresh water, that's scarce as well. Therefore, there's all these initiatives for fresh water, uh, basins, keeping the environment clean, this, that, and the other. Now, we have this concept of efficiency versus equity. Now, it's a big issue in economics is trade-off between efficiency and equity. Efficiency is concerned with the optimal production and allocation of resources given existing factors of production. Equity is concerned with how resources are distributed throughout society. Now this doesn't make too much sense to you as of now I'm assuming, but it will make sense as we go, go on in later chapters. Now one side note that I'm just going to say is factors of production. This is going to be very important to know. Factors of production are land, labor, and capital. These are basically the inputs um, into, into the production process. Market failure. This is a fun one. Market failure is a concept within economic theory wherein the allocation of goods and services by a free market is not efficient. Right? And as we go back to our efficiency definition, it's concerned with the optimal production and allocation of resources giving existing factors of production. Now, there exists another, uh, with market failure, there exists another conceivable outcome where a market participant may be better off without making someone else worse off. And this is known as Pareto optimal outcomes. And we'll be touching upon that later as well. Market failure can be viewed as a scenario where, uh, where individuals' pursuits of pure self-interests leads to results that are not efficient and that can be improved upon uh, from the societal point of view. So when we talk about this, we make trade-offs. And 
everybody is self-interested in their own pursuits. Now, if people get together, they can come out with an outcome where both parties are better off. And this is known as Pareto Optimality, the Nash Equilibrium, and Prisoner's Dilemma, and all very interesting concepts that we'll be talking about a little bit later in the, in the course. Now, the last one that I really want to talk about is externalities. Now, in, in uh, economics, an externality is a cost or a benefit not, tr not transmitted through prices. So this is not reflected in prices, and I'll explain that. Incurred by a party who did not agree to the action causing the cost or the benefit. A benefit in this case is called a positive externality, or an external benefit, while the cost is called a negative externality, or an external cost. So think about this, you're running along the side of the road, and people are driving by. The exhaust fumes are causing you to have a bad run. Now that's a cost, right? But it's a cost that they probably didn't pay for at the pump. You're not receiving any benefit from that. Another example of a negative externality is your neighbor buys a car and it's a really cruddy car, right? It's rusted and he's parking it right across the street from you and you have to look at this car every single day when you go out. It's a negative externality, it's an eyesore. Now on the other hand, let's say that your neighbor plants a tree in the backyard. The tree provides shade and you like shade. He paid for the tree, he put the tree in, you did not have to do anything but you are benefiting from the shade. Now a negative externality from the tree would be the leaves falling onto your lot and into your yard during the fall seasons. So that's a positive externality versus a negative externality. Now please note that um, please note that once I hit the chapter where it's no longer macroeconomics, I will make a note of it so you guys aren't studying the micro material in your macro class. Thanks a lot.